So yeah, okay, great, this is awesome. Um, I'm a policy wonk, I'm used to much smaller spaces, like client round tables, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is great. <laughs> Just a quick question before I get started, does anyone here own a drone? Flown a drone? Okay, so we actually have a drone community. Any drone startups in the space? Okay. Uh, I actually ask that question a lot because it's, it's amazing seeing the spectrum uh, in terms of the, the conversation. So uh, thank you, Mary, for the nice introduction. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Charles Bell. I am the CEO and founder of a small nonprofit located here in San Francisco. We're a think tank, Startup Policy Lab. Uh, we focus on connecting policymakers with the startup community. Uh, primarily what that means is that we work on emergent technology that's driving public policy. So that's how the drone uh, conversation kind of <clears throat> came about. Today, it's gonna be probably a little bit wonky, but I'm gonna talk about um, our project, uh, the City Drones Project. This project was supported by uh, the UC Berkeley Center for Technology, Society, and Policy. And it's all about our work with the City of San Francisco to draft their upcoming drone policy. It hasn't quite been launched yet, but it's on its way. To be fair, we actually don't know, just a bit of a foreshadowing, what the end result is going to look like. Um, thought of this is kind of an investigation, exploration to inform uh, the, the policies to drive that kind of space. So let's just start with like 10,000, maybe 100,000 foot kind of work through this space about why drones are so important um, and why it's going to matter. Uh, drones, in our belief, is going to revolutionize society similar to the way the internet is. Um, and that's because we see it as an enabling technology. And by that I mean it's uh, going to be part of the infrastructure that starts to get leveraged and used in a variety of different ways. Um, what has, it, I should say, not what has changed. Um, drones have actually been around for about 40 odd years in some way, shape, or form. So if like hobby groups have actually been enshrined in, in federal law. Um, quadcopters have been around. One of the jokes from the drone community is, hey, it was just a quadcopter a few years ago. Why, why is this also special right now? So what's really driving this kind of conversation, what's kind of created this inflection point, has been uh, the drop in prices and the ability for more people to have access to drones, to build drones, and to fly them very easily. Uh, the result has really scared regulators. Uh, last Christmas, 20, 2015, is what really was the, the moment. We can actually target it. Um, and retailers put out an estimate that one million drones are going to be sold in Christmas 2015 alone, right? That threw the FAA off. They started doing task force. They started bringing people in. It accelerated the entire process around how uh, we're gonna think about drones. So it follows that regulation is going to happen. <clears throat> And cities are on the front lines of this. Uh, this is just a quick little like, list of the number of people that are registered as drone pilots uh, in, in cities across the United States as the top 10. I, I kind of jokingly refer to this as the honest list, uh, because if you notice two cities that are not on that list, San Francisco and New York City, um, I suspect both of them have more than 1,600 drone operators, but they don't have that many registered. So there's a huge industry and a huge community that's flowing around within our urban spaces, um, and we haven't quite figured out a way to build the infrastructure that integrates them within it. So drones are here, drones are great, um, but drones can cause damage. And for better or worse, regulations are oftentimes about safety. And drones, as much fun as they can be, are plastic and metal objects that fly through the air at 20 to 100 miles per hour, depending on what you're doing. Um, and that means accidents can happen. Um, I, for those who have drones, I don't know, for the people that have flown drones, like I have one of my little baby drones up here, like have you ever hit anybody with any of your drones? Or like, or crashed your drones? Right, you know, you don't, I know you don't know, put your name on it, I have, <laughs> um, purely by accident. Uh, and this is really, really important because it means that uh, how cities are going to address this is managing that accident problem. The, the reality is, is they're not so much worried about terrorists because terrorists are gonna do what terrorists are gonna do, we know that. Criminals are gonna do what criminals are gonna do. But the rest of us, whether it's commerce uh, or recreational users, um, we also wanna be able to use them in a much more, uh, in a much heavily, a very heavy intensive way throughout cities. And that process needs to be managed. The fear is that um, in reaction to that kind of mass use of drones, cities are gonna pass very draconian laws. And uh, this fear is very real. So in the city of San Francisco, uh, it, I don't even know if it made the news, but there was a drone crash. If you know the ferry building uh, down Market and on Embarcadero, uh, a drone crashed into one of the windows. Um, and so shattered all the way down. And it was a big crash, it wasn't a small crash. Luckily, nobody was there at the time. It was like, I think during the evening on a weekend or something like that. But that story, if you talk to the city of San Francisco and the officials that are working on this right now, that's the story that they always go back to. That's what resonates with them when they think about how are they going to manage the urban, uh, the urban airspace. 
So we've got this space. Um, you've got local uh, city government that wants to participate, but taking a step back, it helps, I'm an attorney by training, so it does help to set a little bit of the legal framework for what we're operating in, uh, because it really isn't that simple, and that's part of the, the complications that we're dealing with right now. Um, the Federal uh, Aviation Administration is the regulatory body, they're a federal agency, they're under the Department of Transportation, and they're the ones that have um, uh, the, the authority or jurisdiction, in the parlance, um, over air over aircraft, and aircraft means any device that can fly an inch off the ground, not hops off the ground, but that can fly. So technically even a paper airplane in theory would fall under that, don't worry about that. Um, and traditionally um, what's happened is that the FAA uh, has not worried about um, anything below roughly 500 feet. There's a lot of reasons for that, but let's just put that in the box. Uh, so cities have kind of managed that. Now, one of the reasons is because they've been dealing with manned aircraft. Manned aircraft are very large vehicles. <laughs> they tend to need you know, airports or landing fields. You need training to actually fly them and land them, and they can be tracked fairly easily, if not simply spotted from the, uh, from the ground. Uh, as we shift into this urban landscape, however, uh, drones are introducing a, a much bigger challenge uh, because most drone flights, whether they're rec by recreational users or commercial users, are going to be below 500 feet. Uh, and in San Francisco, to give you a quick, quick example, there are five, uh, 50 um, buildings that are above 500 feet alone, and this isn't a very large city, so you can imagine what this is like in Chicago, New York, LA, uh, and other cities. <clears throat> so what's happened is we have this kind of like rolling uh, potential like legal conflict that's arising. The FAA is trying to sort out in a space that they've never really cared too heavily about. Um, and there are, some, there are very different stakeholders and very different opinions. The National League of Cities, which is an organization uh, that represents cities like in DC, for example, around particular policies, has taken a very aggressive stance and said that, you know, anytime you buy a drone, when you walk in and buy that drone at the counter, you have to register or demonstrate that you have a, a pilot's license to fly that, right? That's a very, very harsh kind of set of rules and practices that they're trying to, to agitate for, specifically because they expect most of the activity to happen at the urban area. Uh, and the fact is, if we're honest about this, um, the truth is local government is gonna have to deal with this, right? Um, when someone is flying a drone in your backyard, you're either going to A, try to shoot it down yourself, right, which has happened, um, or B, you're going to call your local police force. You're not going to call um, the FAA and say, hey, someone's, you know, someone's flying a drone in my backyard. So that means the city government is very much on the, on the forefront. And they've even had to address this from the commercial standpoint <clears throat> because even uh, uh, startups, when they were trying to deal with um, testing and, and flying into, uh, trying to like modes of delivery, for example, they go to the city, they've gone to city government first, like here in San Francisco around 2012, um, several startups went to the city of San Francisco, specifically they went to the mayor's office and said, hey, we need a permit to fly drones. And the city said, that's not really our thing, we don't do that. They went to, and the city went to the FAA. So all that is to say is we have this situation where we have a legal environment that's very, very unknown. As an attorney, that's exciting. For entrepreneurs and technologists, it's really, really annoying. So, how are we looking at drones right now in the urban space? To, to oversimplify, there are kind of three categories, and I've touched upon them already. There's your commercial space, um, and that's what you may have read about when you think about Amazon or Google delivery, or now um, DC has uh, the, the drones that go across the ground and doing food deliveries. Uh, Virginia's testing out with Chipotle because everybody wants their burrito delivered. Uh, that's, you know, there are uh, the recreational use, um, which is a little bit more similar to like rezoning. Um, and rezoning um, drones are kind of cool in the sense that you can do geofencing in certain areas so that there are areas you can fly drones and areas you can't that can be kind of automated, uh, especially for those of us that are trying to follow the rules. And then there's, which I'm gonna talk about a lot more, uh, government use of drones, you know, like the little cop drones, right? Um, and this is, this is kind of the big area that has people kind of scared and, and, and up in arms. Um, what are we seeing right now? So the drone ecosystem itself is actually you know, uh, pretty crowded. Uh, cities are worried about uh, managing safety, while well, at the same time they are attuned to, to innovation. Um, but they are facing several different types of pressure. So uh, one pressure, as I mentioned before, is the legal framework. What, what role do cities have to regulate um, uh, the use or operation of drones in cities when the FAA has the, the overarching authority? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
The second issue is a little bit more practical. What are the internal systems that cities are gonna need? And those internal systems are, are the policies, but they're also the command and control centers, right? So like air traffic control centers. Uh, this, this is actually from NASA. Uh, it turns out that NASA is really leading the work on creating these uh, urban air traffic control systems, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because those are the, you know, they're working on it up in space. Um, they have a, a framework to operate uh, kind of down and with us down here. But most importantly, um, what cities are having a challenge with is they, they lack expertise. Uh, and that's where we kick in. So I mentioned uh, before that we believe in smart regulation. Um, or if I had mentioned it, I'll mention it now. Um, and we believe that smart regulation enables innovation. Um, and that's a big step, uh, we would argue, that a uh, big, big difference from how regulation has been traditionally been treated. So, one of the challenges we face is that there isn't a lot of expertise within government um, at any level because the mass use of drones is so new. And the danger from that is that uh, we're going to see a reaction by policymakers to some kind of incident because people get scared or someone gets hurt. That's not what we want. That's not going to create the world that we want. What we want is we want a, more, a little bit more of a thoughtful policy, um, one that really does support uh, innovation going forward. And we believe that the best way to do that uh, is to develop internal expertise and comfort by policymakers drafting the actual policy. Uh, we got lucky because of the work that we do, because we're pretty tied into the city of San Francisco, that an opportunity arose here in San Francisco to work with the policymakers. So what happens is right now, uh, across the country, basically every city, every major city, has banned the use of drones by um, municipal agencies, right? Because they're just worried about um, operation, privacy, uh, you name it. When the city of San Francisco began to rethink that approach and say, hey, we actually want to start to figure out um, how city agencies can use drones, <clears throat> uh, we had an opportunity to kind of step in and work with them. And, and the reason we started working at the government level is our, our belief was that if we could work with them at the very nascent stages, it were the very early stages of how they're considering policy, they're going to use those lessons to actually apply to commercial and recreational use. So, uh, the, the, our approach was very much driven on these kind of two, two principles of, of data-driven policy and iterative development. Uh, and this meant putting into place procedures uh, for data to be collected through standardized processes. Uh, and it meant uh, developing an iterative process where we didn't necessarily look to draw kind of huge bright line rules, but we allowed our, um, our policymakers to learn as they went forward. So, our objectives, because again, this is a little bit wonky, but this is, this is so you understand kind of what this means in practice. Um, the, the first step was we wanted to help them develop a policy. Um, the policy is currently in draft form. If you live in San Francisco, it should be coming out actually later this year. And so we worked with the staff members signed with working on the policy. We worked with the attorney that's, a part, that's participating, and then we contributed as well in terms of drafting the policy. The second aspect is a report. Uh, we're generating a report targeted at other policymakers. Uh, it's common practice for policymakers to look at other regulators to understand what's the best step or what has worked in other locations. There's always a lot of local flavor that gets involved, but um, that's a way they can kind of keep inching policies forward. Our report's gonna provide insights, checklists, and so forth. The third idea that we had when we started this is we wanted to host a round table. We work with academics, we're kind of you know, wonky. Everybody loves to sit down, talk, think, and engage, and keep talking about you know, what the policies should be like. But what we actually found out is that that wasn't the best approach for the city. Uh, so we dropped doing the round table and we adjusted kind of to the needs of, of what the policymakers were. And it turns out that they needed more um, resources. If you do a search online for drones, you're just much more likely to read a blog post or some type of marketing material than you are to actually find information about policies that are effective or not. Um, so more specifically, kind of what does this mean, especially if you're interested in drones and you're interested in seeing how policy is going to be played out? What we have here is we have the, the two different uh, kind of uh, some high level uh, differences between what the original policy looked like, what policymakers were thinking, and where we're at today. So originally they had a very bright line rule, which was just way too much. It included all 50 departments of the city of San Francisco. Uh, so working with the city, we got them to whittle that down to actually five city departments. Um, so they can actually learn through um, alpha testers about what the use cases are. The second thing is we move them away from this kind of um, open-ended, hey, let's take a look at this in a year, and trying to put into place stronger uh, standards and processes that can actually allow for comparisons from before and after. How did we think we were gonna use the drone? How did we actually use the drone? And there's a lot of processes underneath that that allows uh, data, structured data to be gathered and collected. 
And then finally, we moved more towards kind of what we think of as an iterative approach. One of the biggest challenges the city was facing is that they were including law enforcement in this conversation, and that was scaring a lot of people. Uh, so what they did is they created a big policy, then they tried to create all these little carve-outs of protections. But that just kind of takes you down the wrong route. What we got them to do, going back to just those five departments, is just take law enforcement out. Let's just start small. Let's just start kind of almost like a, you know, an MVP and build from that and start to see what kind of use cases um, that come about and then we can add law enforcement back in. One thing I do like to say though about law enforcement is that they weren't actually pushing this. SFPD wasn't, wasn't the big agitator for it. Um, they were actually okay with not necessarily being the, uh, included. It was, there were others that were, that were pushing for them. So in practice, so what does this mean for the future of kind of the, the urban airspace as it were? Um, so there were five different um, um, agencies that were surfaced to be the, the leads on this, the alpha testers, if you will. Um, and they all actually have pretty reasonable use cases, um, and that's awesome. There are, there are other agencies, to be fair, that want to participate. We're, they're just kind of limited at the moment. Uh, briefly, just to give you an idea of the, con to give you some context idea for, for, for them. Uh, the controller's office, uh, they are very worried about the big one, so in San Francisco, the earthquake. So kind of their approach is they want to map the city now, and then they want to map the city after, so they can see where damage has occurred. Also, they want to be able to map the city and start to see where maybe vulnerabilities are, are, uh, exist. The second one is the fire department. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, search and rescue. Um, it, it sounds great. Drones flying over um, burning like buildings, but actually the city of San Francisco, the fire department SFFD, um, is also does the bay, search and rescue in the bay. So you can imagine when boats are, are flipping over or people are overboard, how much easier it would be to um, deploy a drone out there to do search and rescue, to drop life rafts and so on and so forth. The Public Utilities Commission, um, most people don't even know really about this commission, but they oversee basically um, all the infrastructure. So if you've had a glass of water today, they're the ones that kind of oversaw that, the, the, the transfer of water, the lights, um, uh, and communications. They also own um, property in six counties around San Francisco. And they have to inspect those properties. And they can oftentimes be very inaccessible. Drones are obviously a cost saving uh, for them. Finally, port, or not finally, but port is also very similar. They want to use both land drones and sea drones to obviously uh, survey the port. And then the recreation and parks, they want to inspect uh, roofs, trees, and golf courses. San Francisco is a great parks movement, but it actually can be really expensive to do inspection and maintenance. This is where things get really, really kind of, kind of intense. What we tried to do is uh, kind of 10,000 foot this to make it digestible. And, and really, it's privacy issues. Um, and this is more than just government. So it may seem like these are just governmental concerns, but this type of conversation, this type of framework is what's going to play into uh, uh, conversations in the, private and uh, in the private space. And I know that only because we're, we're, we're talking about it already with the Federal Trade Commission. Um, what we did is we, we did analysis of those five um, departments. We looked at their use cases, uh, and then we looked at what the risk uh, levels were. Uh, and then we looked at that within eight different contexts by six different stakeholders. Uh, in a kind of an ode to Tufty, if you're familiar with Tufty, we tried to make it easy through the colors, but um, green doesn't mean perfect. <laughs> what this means is it's really a spectrum from low risk to high risk. Green just means this is an opportunity to, to, to take a chance and kind of move forward. Red means something that you've got really high risk and you should probably go slow on. So that's kind of the, the first takeaway. There's no such thing as no risk. Uh, the other thing is that drone use implicates multiple stakeholders. Um, and it's going to, again, whether you're in the public or private space, and cities are going to have to manage that, uh, not just with their own use, but with the use by private operators uh, around the city. And then finally, there's no clear blueprint to follow, right? Um, this is an analysis, but this analysis is only the first step to try to figure out how the framework of thinking about this uh, should go forward. So. Building on that, what we, what we tried to do is, is generate resources for, for the cities. Um, and it's especially important for those, if you're outside of government, you want to work in government or work with policymakers, which I always encourage people to do, to have your voice heard. And it highlights one of the biggest challenges uh, we have, and I think others have when trying to influence policy. Uh, the tools oftentimes we build don't solve the problem. We're kind of a solution in search of a, of a problem. So what we did is we tried to figure out what were the problems that pol the policymakers here were facing, and, and how can we try to build tools that'll, that'll help, help other policymakers outside of San Francisco. And that goes back to policymakers looking to other policymakers about how to make policy. So what we did is we took, uh, we went and did a survey essentially, we were already doing it anyways, of um, laws that are going uh, throughout the United States States and internationally that might be relevant, and we just put them online. 
it, I mean, it sounds kind of simple, but those are the kinds of things that actually do have an impact on policymakers. What happens is they end up contacting us because they're doing searches online looking for this type of, of information. Uh, looking forward, what this allows us also to do is it allows us to keep building and adding to it. So this can be more of a dynamic um, as opposed to a static state. Uh, another thing that we're, we're looking at building on, uh, it's policymakers are humans. So when they have a question, they do what we all do, right? They go and Google it. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that per se, and there's nothing wrong with Google necessarily. But when you're trying to figure out policy, if you're just going out and Googling things, um, you don't necessarily know if it's timely or if it's relevant um, or if it's actually applicable to you. So that information that I talked about before, um, we put the laws online. We also ended up collecting a huge amount of other information that we're marking up internally. And we're making that available through a search tool uh, in-house, or excuse me, uh, internally, that they'll be able to just go do a quick search for whatever policies and find out, hey, is this actually still relevant? Is this good law? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, three lessons um, that we have from, from our experience. Uh, the first one is that uh, how we have thought about privacy uh, before um, is going to have to change. There's a framework especially that's, been, that's kind of built up, I'll say, since with the internet around notice and consent, if you're familiar. Um, that doesn't work too well with drones because they collect data or they can collect data in very indiscriminate manners. Um, so that approach isn't going to work. So what does that mean going forward? Uh, well, it's clear that we're going to have to have more conversations, not necessarily roundtables, that bring that stakeholder conversation back in, where people can start to say, hey, look, here's a challenge, here's a problem. Did you even know you're collecting information in this way? Did you know you're sharing information in this way? How can you encrypt that? How can you anonymize that? And so on and so forth. But there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. So there's a lot of opportunity for entrepreneurship in this space, not necessarily just with the drone themselves, but with all the back end, with the APIs, developers, and so on and so forth. The second thing is that data-driven policymaking really does actually begin with data collection. Uh, city agencies um, are actually perfectly positioned um, to do a huge amount of data collection in a brand new way that would inform private industry. So you can imagine with drones right now, we can collect the flight data, we can combine that with the manufacturer's data, when we can combine that with weather data, we can combine that with GIS information. Okay. You, but with city information, we can also combine the uh, flight, um, excuse me, the intention of the flight, the business justification for it, and we can combine that with the experience of the pilot because we can track that as well. All of that goes forward to actually build a database of information that really lets us figure out when we have real problems, what are the different types of use cases, because we can actually get a very full picture of what's going on. And then finally, um, use cases are really important. If you're into technology and policy, one of the biggest challenges we face is uh, government oftentimes wants to put a policy down first and then kind of figure out how technology fits into that. But if we can actually drive the policy through use cases first, we can highlight and surface problems before they become like litigation or they become kind of a national fight. And a quick example of that is when we worked with the city, uh, the city agencies and we got their business justifications, um, they had to provide information about their data retention policies. Well, it turned out that a lot of them said we have a data retention policy. Policy. And it's like, yeah, but your data retention policy doesn't touch anything that you just wanted, you requested to use drones for. And in other instances, it turned out that they said, we have a data retention policy. And then they said, oh, whoop, no, we don't, right? So it's like, oh, so you actually need a data retention policy. Can we craft one that matches for the entire city? Probably not. But you can start to surface those issues before you get a massive lawsuit or you have citizens starting to feel um, un uh, encumbered by what or overly burdened by what uh, government is doing. But at the end of the day, the real goal really needs to be to bake innovation into policymaking from the very beginning. Uh, and that, that, as I start to kind of close this up, because that's really a lot of the theme uh, for the work that we do, which is all about smart regulation. And that is regulation to enable innovation, not deregulating just for the sake of, of thinking you're going to support innovation. And that's because we believe innovation actually can uh, enable and support innovation. Uh, and the reason for that is that technology is shaped by our interests and values. Right? What we invest in, what we build out, really does reflect our, you know, our goals. And there's nothing wrong with that, um, but that's something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, and the second part is, that, again, regulation can encourage innovation. There are ways that we can use policymaking to actually open the door to new ways of thinking. Um, and so uh, a quick example, because we do work at the, we're doing stuff at the federal level as well. Right now, um, the FAA is requiring um, everyone over the age of 13 to register uh, with uh, the FAA to be a pilot for, for a manned, uh, unmanned aircraft. 
Well, that's great, but now the, the FAA is managing a national database of licenses. Um, now, they do this for, uh, for manned aircraft, so it's not it's something that's completely out of the scope of their, of their, of their purview. But you can imagine if 10% of the United States ended up getting a drones license, that's 30 million licenses that now the FAA is in charge of managing. Okay, let's say that that's all right as well. Well, what does that mean for innovation as drones are starting to evolve? We actually, we're, the argument that we're making and we're putting forth in a white, upcoming white paper is that the FAA should actually adopt a model that's similar to the ICANN model. If, if, those, if you've ever registered a domain name, you've used like Namecheap or GoDaddy or what have you. Um, they actually have third party private operators where you register, but it's all kind of managed to some extent uh, way back by the Department of Commerce. It's kind of under that, that, that weird jurisdiction. We want the FAA to do the same thing. We want the FAA to get out of the business of licensing um, unmanned vehicle or pilots for unmanned um, aerial systems, drones, um, and we want them to actually empower third-party registers to do this process. What we think that would allow, we actually think third-party registrars are better positioned to keep pace with innovation in this space. They can build back-end APIs much faster, they can connect with other parties, and the quick example we always use is, imagine if you have you register with a third-party um, registrar, they're connected to an insurance company, you can do pay-as-you-go um, insurance based based on your experience, based on your drone, based on your location, based on the weather, based on other drones that are in the air. That's possible. That's not likely if the FAA completely controls this process from the very top. So with that said, um, thank you so much. Uh, I know this gets a little uh, wonky, um, but uh, thank you Dreamforce, thank you Mary, and uh, thank you so much for attending and listening to me talk for like 30 minutes. <laughs>